I would uh, second what Amos said because uh, Paul said, I would not have you ignorant, brethren. And my little joke is that the biggest denomination in the world is the ignorant brethren. Yeah. So uh, let's, let's get... Uh, uh, I'm going to talk about the rapture, which is uh, controversial. I think that's the way Satan likes it. Um, I have nothing against those who disagree or have different viewpoints, and many are good Christian brothers, so we are entitled to have disagreements about this. Uh, but this is why I think we are having a pre-tribulation rapture in the not-too-distant future. Right, the seven-year Great Tribulation. There are many names given to this period in both Old and New Testaments. They all refer to a seven-year period of the outpouring of God's wrath. It starts with the signing of a seven-year peace treaty between Israel and Antichrist. The seal judgments, Revelation 6, start with the Lamb opening the first of seven seals. From the beginning, the judgments are from God. Will the church go through the tribulation or are we taken out? And... Uh, well, some people say, well, that's just wishful thinking. Well, you know, whatever it is, I hope not to be there when the tribulation starts. It will be the worst time in the history of the world. Most of the world's population will be killed, and there certainly won't be any practicing church, though there will be people saved. A pastor friend in America, in Tennessee, he said to me, his, his friend had started to doubt the pre-tribulation rapture, and he said he thought his head would be on the chopping block during the tribulation. And I, I, I decided to reassure him. I, I said, his head won't be on any block. It's the church. And here we must split the church from the true church, not the church with the stained glass windows necessarily. The true church won't be here. I shouldn't have said about the stained glass windows because I get into trouble. Nothing against stained glass. It's some of the images on it I don't like. I once did a, a television broadcast in a big church in Tennessee. It went out live across the southern states. And uh, I started raving on about uh, stained glass windows. And Pat was at the back, trying to keep me under control as ever, going... <laughs> and she pointed out that I was standing in front of an 80-foot stained glass window. I hadn't noticed it. No, I didn't get invited back. It was a Baptist church. So the sta anyway, never mind. It was... <laughs> so there's nothing wrong. We like stained glass. It's just the images of saints and Mary that I don't like, basically. Anyway, travelling the globe is the norm for many people for the first time in history. The true church is in the departure lounge. So what's the rapture? What is it exactly? Well, it's a wondrous event, a spectacular event. And it will take place perhaps in the near future when our Lord will come in the air, catch up the church from the earth, and then return to heaven with the church. The Apostle Paul gave a clear description of the event in his letters to the Thessalonians and Corinthians. It's a promise to the church. The concept of the rapture was not revealed in the Old Testament to the Old Testament prophets because it is a promise to the New Testament church, not to the saints of God who lived before. The establishment of the church, which was at Pentecost, of course. Jesus will return as a bridegroom for his bride. That bride consists of church age saints. We're coming shortly to the end of the church age. So what about uh, the pre-church saints? Is it fair? Do they not take part? Well, of course. The saints of the Old Testament era will be resurrected at the end of the tribulation, but not at the time of the rapture of the church. Daniel reveals this, Daniel 12, 1 and 2, where he says the saints of that age will be resurrected at the end of the time of distress. They will join us in the marriage supper. Here are two key scriptures which are well known, I'm sure, to you. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 53, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. Here's 1 Corinthians. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised, incorruptible, 
and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. And the older you get, the uh, uh, more you hanker for a new body, I can tell you, <laughs> an incorruptible one. It's an event happening at the last trump. Mid- and post-trib advocates say this is the seventh trumpet of Revelation. It's very easy to disprove this. When 1 Corinthians was written, Revelation had not been written. The last trump refers, as you know when you visit Israel, to the Feast of Trumpets, which concludes with a long trumpet blast. The Corinthians would have been familiar with this and had celebrated it. So that's the trump we're talking about. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. All this knowledge is supposed to be a comfort to us in times of trouble. The Lord's cry of command is to wake the dead in Christ, just as Lazarus was called forth. Michael the archangel would deliver the trumpet call. The Lord said, I go to prepare a place for you, John 14, 1 and 3. This contains a hint of the rapture, as Christ promises to return for the believers, including the dead in Christ. The 70 weeks of Daniel. This is key, understanding the 70 weeks of Daniel. The angel Gabriel told the prophet Daniel the future of the Jewish people. 70 weeks were determined, so this would not change. The weeks were a term for sets of years. One week stood for seven years instead of seven days. So a period of time, 70 times seven years, was determined. 490 years. The 70 weeks, 490 years, was for the Jews. For Gabriel said, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, the Jews, and thy holy city, Jerusalem. It had nothing to do with the church and nothing to do with the rapture. Gabriel was speaking to Daniel, who had been taken, as you know, with other exiles when Babylon conquered Jerusalem in 597 BC. Jerusalem was then in ruins. The 70 weeks of years divided. It began with a, a Babylonian decree to restore and rebuild the, the ruins of Jerusalem. It was split into three parts. Seven weeks, seven times seven, 49 years. 62 weeks, 62 by seven, 434 years. And one week of seven years. The 49 years was for the rebuilding. And the long period of the 62 weeks was waiting for the Messiah who arrived precisely on schedule. The final week of seven years is yet to run. Seven years of trouble, the time of Jacob's trouble, the Jews call it. Gabriel's prophecy said that the Messiah, the anointed one, will be cut off, killed, after the 483 years, and Jerusalem would again be destroyed, which it was in 70 AD. That's when the prophetic time clock stopped, because the final week of years is still outstanding. One particular event restarts the clock, and it's not the rapture. Back to the word. Gabriel said, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. The he is the prince that shall come, who will destroy the city yet again and bring desolations. When he reaffirms the covenant, the final seven-year period begins to roll out. There is no mention of the church in all this. It is for the Jewish people. The church is not mentioned after chapter 3 of Revelation. The focus is on Israel and the Jewish people. The Jewish people, that's the way God has determined to bring them back to himself. The rapture does not begin the final seven-year period of Gabriel's prophecy. The signing of a covenant starts it. This is important because some popular preachers say we, believers in the pre-trib rapture, say the rapture begins the tribulation. We do not say that. We say what Gabriel said, that the tribulation period begins with the signing of a seven-year covenant. We believe the church is gone in the rapture by that time when Antichrist signs. We believe there is a gap between the rapture and the signing of the covenant. It could be a short time or it could be several years. Nobody knows. 
the 70 weeks of Daniel. Let's recap to make sure. It's a little hard to grasp at first, so you need this really in writing or on a, on a screen to stop and go back and re review. The first 62 weeks of years ended in the week of the crucifixion. We are now in the church age. This has to finish before the final week of years, seven years, can run its course. This starts with the signing of the peace treaty with Israel. The church is removed out first, but there may be a gap before the final week. It could be a short gap or a, one of a few years. We don't know. Here's the main sign that we're close to all these things happening. Israel, as I said earlier, 1948, from Matthew 24, 32 to 34. Israel is the fig tree. We planted a fig tree on a, on a balcony in Israel about two weeks ago. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when you, see, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. So we watch the fig tree grow when we go back, if they remember to water it. <laughs> the focus is on Israel, the fig tree. From 1948, the prophetic clock moved to one minute to midnight. I'll tell you, shall I tell you a funny? Yeah, I'll tell you an old story. If you look closely at this picture, you'll see a fire engine. And this is by the infidels' entrance and also the Jewish entrance to the Temple Mount, you see, because the Islamics go through a much grander entrance the other side of the Western Wall. And um, when I was there a few years back, I read a story in the Drew Post, which is the English language newspaper, of course. Um, they said there's a big dispute because this ramshackle uh, sort of shed-like structure that covers the walkway up into the Temple Mount um, was a, a fire hazard. It was dangerous, you see. But this being Israel, there was a monumental dispute about what should be done about it and who should take it down, who should replace it, whose it was, etc., etc. There was many a dispute and debate. And um, so then the fire brigade, oh, they, they, the fire brigade said it should be shut because it was a fire hazard. And then they came up, this is a real Israeli solution. They said, we'll station a fire engine there on permanent standby so that if it crashes to the ground, catches fire, we're on hand to rescue people. I thought, I don't believe this. About a week later, I went to Jerusalem. There was a fire engine stuck. I said, it's true, it's true, it's there. And uh, they're there. So when it all collapses and crushes to the ground and in flames or whatever, which I don't think it will, but supposing it did, the fire brigade's there on hand, fire and rescue, you see. So that, this is Jerusalem. It's a very odd place in some ways. But uh, I went up it when they were rebuilding it. It was pretty dangerous, actually, because there were big holes in the floor floor but um, we got there and I got the pictures you saw there it is the temple mount they wouldn't let Pat up there because she was carrying a religious artifact that's a menorah so you can't go up there waving a cross or a menorah because these are religious artifacts and they're banned on the temple mount so there we go so when will the rapture be three of the main views there's others pre-tribulation that's before this period called the day of the lord or the great tribulation mid-trib in the middle of the population, that's in three and a half years after it starts. Post-trib, that's at the end of the seven years, at the second coming of Christ, when he returns to save Israel and destroy his enemies. Then in 1990, Martin, Marvin Rosenthal wrote something called the pre-wrath rapture of the church. <laughs> he launched the idea into the church based on the theories of an investment banker called Robert Van Campen, a billionaire, whose fortune paid for thousands of books to be sent to churches across America. And he, he had sort of got this idea 10 or 20 years earlier. So it's a relatively new concept. And Martin Rosenthal is the, Marvin Rosenthal is the man who popularized it and got it talked about and into the public domain. Here is basically what they say. The pre-wrath rapture has the church raptured just before the bold judgments of Revelation 16 of the last quarter of the tribulation. That's over five years into it. They are the only judgments this view considers to be the wrath of God, leaving the seal and trumpet judgments as wrath from man and Satan. But, as I said earlier, the Lord himself breaks the seals, starting the Revelation 6 seal judgments at the beginning of the tribulation. I regard this pre-wrath theory as a fallacy because it puts the rapture at some point in the last quarter of the tribulation. The argument is that the church is promised protection only 
from the wrath of God and not the wrath of man or of Satan. It is said that only the trumpet and bowl judgments are actually God's wrath, and these are placed in the last quarter of the tribulation, despite the fact that the book of Revelation clearly places the trumpet judgments in the first half of the tribulation. The seal judgments are allegedly the wrath of man and Satan. But our Lord launches the seal judgments. Our Lord breaks the seals. Read about it in Revelation 6. These judgments are at the start of the tribulation and are referred to as the wrath of the Lamb. Revelation 6 verse 16. All the judgments of Revelation are overseen by God. That's why we're told in Revelation 15 verse 1 that the bold judgments at the end of the tribulation will finish the wrath of God, not begin it. The pre-wrath idea denies the doctrine of imminence. Throughout uh, the history of the church, believers were expecting at any time an imminent second advent. The Bible is clear that Lord Jesus could return at any moment and we should be looking for his return. Matthew 24, verse 44. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. And also Philippians 4, verse 5. Colossians 3, verses 4. 1 Thessalonians 1, 10. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 6. Titus 2, verse 13. And Revelation 16, verse 15. There are others. The pre wrath view says... Our Lord cannot return until after Antichrist appears. The temple's been rebuilt and the world has suffered about five years of the wrath of man and Satan. This is what uh, Dave Regan calls the three-quarter trib view. So we should be looking, living, looking for the Antichrist and not Jesus Christ. It's not scriptural. The pre-trib rapture, the doctrine of imminence, it could happen tomorrow, is a lovely... Uh, uh, video. It's on Facebook and uh, it's a film made in an Australian church and the pastor is teaching about the pre-tribulation rapture and he's there in quite a big church and he says the rapture could happen at any minute, it could happen before I've finished speaking and then there's a big flash and everybody's gone apart from one or two backsliders at the back of the church you know. <laughs> so I thought yeah that's a very good way of illustrating it. <laughs> uh, anyway. But those who argue that the pre-trib rapture view is just too new to be considered viable point to John Nelson Darby as its originator. They claim he took the idea from a 15-year-old girl named Margaret MacDonald. This is just ba basically not true. Uh, Margaret MacDonald was a, a girl who had some odd ideas. She never ever mentioned a pre-tribulation rapture or any rapture view as far as I know. And uh, Darby was talking about the pre-trib rapture years before she came on the scene. The, the, chronology, the chronology of it doesn't bear out this argument. Someone actually came over to Scotland. I saw him on TV two days ago. And he did a thorough investigation. He's a pastor of a big church in America. Went to uh, all the sort of origin of all this in Scotland and uh, uh, proven without any doubt that it's not true. Right from the start, the church believed in an imminent rapture. The early church fathers, here's just a few, Barnabas, Papias, Justin Martyr, Arrhenius, Tertullian, Hippotolus, Cyprian, and Lactanius, and so on, they wrote on the imminent return of Jesus Christ, which is the central argument for the pre-tribulation rapture view. Many others, this is just a few of them actually. Early church fathers, these were not modern people writing. But when it came along, um, St. Augustine, as he's called, We've got a church in Aldershot called St. Augustine's. It's a very high church. It's Anglican. Augustine did a lot of damage because he began spiritualizing the Bible. His view of a, a non-literal literal interpretation, in other words, oh, it can mean almost anything. You can just spiritualize it. In other words, you take over from God and make it believe whatever you want and make it, make it sort of almost anything. If you spiritualize the words of God, the words of Scripture, it can mean anything. You can go down all kinds of windy, strange paths. But his view of a non-literal interpretation took hold of the church until the Renaissance, obliterating the premillennial and pre-tribulation rapture views in favour of amillennialism, which is what most of the church believes today. But some medieval writers, such as the ones I, I note here, wrote statements that distinguished the rapture from the second coming. There were still people all through um, the Middle Ages and onwards that uh, were questioning this and saying, no, the rapture is distinguishable from the second coming. It's in two parts, basically. 
So all the tribulation is God's wrath. The seven angels who blow the trumpets, starting each trumpet judgment, are given their trumpets at the throne of God. Revelation 8, verse 2. Revelation 15, verse 1 says, The bold judgments at the end of the tribulation finish the wrath of God. Not begin it. Because these judgments are initiated by our Lord himself, at the beginning of the tribulation, the whole tribulation must be God's wrath, which the church is exempt from. Other ideas include a pan-trib position. They've got no real hope or clue, but I hope it will all pan out in the end, you see. So. Sorry about that. False prophets love to predict the date of the rapture. The, we have had some odd experiences in our travels. But we were in America. I was speaking at a prophecy conference in uh, Bristol, Virginia. Um, at the time when Harold Camping, who was a, a major broadcaster, he's dead now, he knows better now, but he was actually promoting on his Christian radio network um, the return of Christ. It's a bit like the Adventists, you see. You get it wrong, then you spiritualise it. So, save the date, return of Christ, May the 21st, 2011, you see. And... Uh, I was there with a lot of top prophecy preachers from America and we were all having a good laugh about it because our prophecy conference was ending on May the 21st. We said, well, we hope to be here to finish it, you know. Uh, <laughs> if Harold's right, we'll probably not be here, you know, or whatever. Or the, the Lord's going to return and they won't be coming to prophecy conferences here. So we were just having a joke. And of course, May 21st passed. Harold Camping was made to look like a, a rather foolish person. He meant well. He, he wasn't doing it to deliberately mislead, as far as I know. He was just sort of thought he got the truth. Well, you go back to the word. Don't sort of make things up and think that the Lord has spoken to you with a very special message. The chances are it probably is not true. False prophets, and he was one certainly, ignore Matthew 24, verse 36, Matthew 24, 44, and Matthew 25, verse 13. 24, 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Matthew 24, 44. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. We'd have our candles burning. Matthew 25, 13. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Although we can't know the date, we can know the general time frame because when the fig tree Israel started to bloom, has leaves but little fruit, we're supposed to be ready. That's when things really start to get interesting because the end times prophecies couldn't be concluded without Israel. The higher critics in Germany demolished the book for decades, hundred years, because they laughed and said, well, all the focus of the Bible, the end times, is, is on Israel. Israel is not a nation. It doesn't exist. The Bible got it wrong. The Bible never gets it wrong. The word of God is infallible. It's all God-breathed. All scripture is God-breathed. And it's 100% accurate. If there were one flaw, one error, one mistake in the whole Bible, all 66 books from cover to cover, the Bible would be invalidated because there is no mistake. God's word cannot have any mistakes in it. It is inerrant. So, Israel, that was the fig tree which started to bud a little. So, from the sound of sound reasoning and the word of God, I hope to pre prove the reality of the pre-tribulation rapture. From the beginning, the church taught a pre-trib rapture of believers. The rapture, the blessed hope of believers, was looked for in the early church. Some Christians were so sure of it happening in their day, that they stopped working and waited. Read about this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. Paul told them to get back to work and stop being idle. Yet it might have a long wait. You know, you probably won't be able to live and eat if you wait because it's not going to happen necessarily right way. It could do, but it didn't. The rapture is in the epistle of Barnabas in the first century. Irenaeus taught it, as did Hippo, Hippo, Hippolyta, sorry, I'm having trouble with this, his disciple in the second century. It's, it's an early belief. It's not something new. The rapture could be today. Nothing whatsoever in Scripture needs to be fulfilled before this astounding event takes place. The world's greatest news story. I wish I'd be writing the headlines. That's, that used to be my job. One of them, I used to write headlines. I love writing headlines. That's a good one. Millions vanish worldwide. 
alien abduction speculation as hysteria mounts. That is not a fantasy, by the way. One of the many things I did in my life, I researched UFOs and the men in black for years. We joined an investigation group into aerial phenomena. phenomena. That's another hard one. And uh, I, I used to spend hours, wasted tens of hours of my life trying to sort of find the truth about it. Finding the truth about UFOs is like nailing jelly. You do hours of investigation, you interview people who are perfectly sincere and telling what they believe to be the truth, and you never ever get to the bottom of it. I've actually interviewed people who watch radar and saw vast objects travelling across the sky at incredible speed and change angle at right angles, which can't happen. It's not possible in, in science. So uh, things are out there, but from my experience in the new age, I can tell you that they are cult, demonic things. And um, Gary Bates uh, does a great talk about this. He was a speaker at a prophecy conference I was at in Dallas, and he is the head of uh, Creation Ministries International in America, and he's got tons and tons of research uh, about the men in black and so on. There's a lot of demonic activity at the moment because Satan knows his time is short. And there certainly are UFOs, but they're not actual physical things. Um, people say, well, I know someone who's taken up in one. Well, it's done with hypnotism. And um, Gary Bates investigated a lot of these reports. And in how many was it, Pat? How many? 100 or 200? 400. 400 cases where aliens were coming for these people and they're going to take them away for experiment and so on. Um, the people were Christians. They said, in the name of Jesus, stop. Nothing happened. They all, they all went, all these creatures dissolved and went away and the people were safe. So they are obviously satanic, they're obviously demonic activity. They are not real, but they actually exist, if you can see the difference. And um, I did story after story about this. I interviewed pilots who'd seen things, did one for the National Enquirer in America. Another one, this became, this is how you've got to separate the myth and imagination from truth, you see. Truth is possible if you dig down. I interviewed a, a, a half-crazy old man called Alf Bertou, Alfred Bertou. Then I took a photograph of him. He looked like a mad old chap, actually. And um, anyway, he called the... All kinds of people used to call up and ring or walk into newspaper offices in those days. You'd be amazed. Half the fruitcakes of the world used to come in and see me, and, or try to. I, I had a barrier of people between me and them. And, and keep some of them at bay. Anyway, Alf Bertou piqued my interest, so I went to interview him. I went out because I was interested in UFOs. And uh, he was walking along the banks of a canal, the Basingstoke Canal, if you want to be precise, with his little dog, you see, old elf. He was about 75 or so, walking along with his little dog. A flying saucer was on the canal bank, as it happens often on the Basingstoke Canal, and <laughs> in among the water reeds. I hope it was uh, uh, not damaging the fauna and flora of the environment. Anyway... Alf walks along, and a, a space being comes out and says, uh, Mr. Bertou, we want you to be an experiment in our saucer. Um, so they wanted to examine his body, and a sort of fairly wrinkly old body, you see. So anyway, they took him up and put him, strapped him down. This was his tail, you see. And uh, <laughs> started to examine him, and said, your body is too old for our purposes, you must go. So they chucked him out, him and his dog, and he walked back down the canal bank and waved goodbye, you see. So... It, I, I, took, I, I put a full-page story in on page three of this with a picture of Alf and the day Alf met the spaceman, you say. But I wrote it as a joke, right? If you read it, I've still got the story, actually. If you read it, it's obvious that I was having a laugh because I didn't write, I didn't criticise him, I didn't, but it was not intended as a serious news story. I should know better. This went round the world and it's now in all this sort of textbooks of UFOs saying this was a true event and it was actually recorded. And they sent a copy to our newspaper for review. And I reviewed it and said it was a load of cobblers. It was, it was, always, it was obvious it was a congenital liar. Uh, I didn't actually say that because I didn't want to be offensive to the old boy. But I said, uh, it's a load of nonsense. You know? And, and I, I wrote it as a joke. And do you know, everybody hated me. I had phone calls. Oh, how dare you criticise this old man? How do you dare you say it's not true? It obviously wasn't true, but people want to believe this stuff, you see. It's very hard 
if to say this is actually the truth and this is the fiction, it was obvious fiction, and I know I originated the story, you weren't there, you didn't meet him, you don't know. Ah, oh, but it's in a book. Well, anyone can write a book. We write books. <laughs> so you know, I just wanted to say that because uh, the New Age people have this plan, and it's been re real at things like psychic fairs. I think Dave Hunt said it, it had been told to him once. Uh, he said that uh, they have a plan saying, when the rapture happens, they don't call it the rapture, um, the source of people have taken out these Christian nuisances for re-education because they're standing in the way of progress of the new world order and a green world and so on and so on. And uh, so they've been taken out of the picture because they were holding up progress. And um, again, with the new age, they believe very much in this kind of thing with the flying saucers. They say when all the mayhem starts, the masters of Maitreya will meet there's 12... 12 of them, they meet over Tibet and decide what's going to happen. We were actually launching newspapers, in, interestingly, because they were secular newspapers. But the idea was that when the uh, time of the end came, and the, the people who are in the New Age have got a good idea, although a warped idea, of what's going to happen at the time of the end. They've got a kind of warped version of the Book of Revelation, but they've got some idea of what's going to happen. And um, they said, well... Um, the source of people are going to come and, and take people off, and that's why there are films like uh, about UFOs and that, because the world is getting ready. And already, I would say, a high percentage of young people believe in UFOs as real things. So it won't come as a great surprise, far-fetched though this may sound to you, because you're more rational and reasonable and probably older than most, uh, most of the young people who are believing in this. But um, that is one explanation that they can give. You see, there'll have to be... If of people go suddenly missing from the face of the earth, leaving behind their clothes and their possessions and everything else, the TV set on maybe, um, someone's going to have to give an explanation. Well, if you think the men in black are phantoms, well, if people, enough people believe they're real, and I think enough people do, they'll swallow it, they'll believe almost anything. They're brainwashed. But anyway, back to the rapture. Although the date is not known, sorry Harold, we know the sequence of end-time events from the Jewish feasts. The rapture is foreshadowed in the sequence of seven Jewish feasts, something which the church today misses. We are now on the verge of the climax of world history. Seven prophetic feasts of Israel from Leviticus 23 and Numbers 28 and 29. It's like a, a timeline of history. Passover, vital event which secured the future of the Jewish people, is Christ's atoning death, because funnily enough, uh, that was celebrated exactly the same time as Easter. We celebrated that on the Saturday. Sunday was Resurrection Sunday, the next day. Unleavened bread is Christ's burial. The first fruits, our Lord's resurrection. Pentecost on a Sunday, the birthday of the church. The first four events happened on the feast dates, fulfilling the prophetic feast. Trumpets could be the rapture of the church, the day of, the, of atonement when the Jews repent and our Lord returns, and then tab tabernacles could be the millennium. I think it's a reasonable uh, thesis anyway. The first three feasts in the spring were all literally fulfilled in the sinless life, death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Fifty days later, on the fourth feast, Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came down and the church was born. The last three feasts, the autumn feasts, are still to be fulfilled. Here is the menorah, the seven-branched lamp, which was always lit in the temple and is a visual aid for history. On the left are the first three feasts relating to our Lord's first coming, all fulfilled on the days of the feasts. The middle is the fourth feast, Pentecost, the birthday of the church fulfilled on the day of the feast. The last three are the autumn feasts relating to the second coming. The next feast to be fulfilled, the Feast of Trumpets, is in September stroke October. The Jewish Feast of Trumpets symbolizes the return of the Lord for his church, the rapture of the church. There is even a crown for all those who love the Lord's appearing. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. The Jews called the Feast of Trumpets the feast where nobody knows the day nor the hour. I think that's interesting because it varies according to the time of the new moon. It's the root of the expression, a movable feast. Since the Lord is coming at a time when we think not, we have to be ready at all times 
whether it's on the Feast of Trumpets or some other day. Now here's an excuse for some reading photographs from our family. Our daughter had a Jewish wedding, as Arnold Fruchtenbaum performing the ceremony, and um, it was at an even event evangelical church in Surrey. And, uh, of course, um, Annie married a, a young Jewish man called Michael Nissim, and, uh, who now is the co-pastor of this church that I told you about. But the rapture is typified by a Jewish wedding, which is extremely significant. In a Jewish wedding at the time of our Lord, by tradition, the groom arrived unannounced. The bride had to be ready, just like the church. In Revelation 19, verses 7 to 8, we read about the marriage itself. When it's time for the wedding, the groom goes to the bride's house unannounced, takes her by surprise. But she's ready. She comes out to meet him, and he takes her to his father's house. This mirrors the events of the pre-trib rapture scenario. Jesus, the groom, comes down from heaven, calls up the church to his father's house for the wedding. We are in heaven during the seven-year tribulation. After the vows, the bridegroom of Jesus' day took his bride for a seven-day honeymoon. This is a picture of our time with the Lord in heaven while the earth goes through seven years of the tribulation, described in the book of Revelation. In an ancient Jewish wedding, the bridegroom would next leave his father's house and bring the bride to his own house. The Lord will bring us back to church to take possession and we will rule with him. It's all symbolic in the Jewish wedding ceremony. The marriage takes place in the Father's house in heaven. The marriage supper is later on earth with all the Old Testament saints plus the tribulation saints resurrected and invited as guests. It's the first event of the millennium. Very happy it'll be. Our Lord promised to take his bride, the church, to his Father's house and warn us to be ready. If the true church has not been in heaven with our Lord, we would not be able to return with him at the end of the tribulation, just in time for the marriage supper, which will be a gigantic whole world celebration. This is a marriage supper. The idea that the church goes through the tribulation violates the wedding imagery the Bible uses to describe the relationship between Christ and the church. He will not punish his bride for seven years and then marry her. <laughs> Come up hither, Revelation 4, verse 1. It's a prophetic reference to the rapture of the church, leaving Revelation chapters 1 through 3 as a description of the church age. After that, no church. Read it. After the shout to Come up hither, the church is not mentioned until chapter 19. The text switches clearly from the church to the Jews in Israel. Why will the rapture be pre-trib? Imminence. Titus 2, verse 13. Paul refers to the ever-present possibility of Christ's return. It's known as the blessed hope. He also taught the Lord's coming will be as a thief in the night. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1-6. We are to be watchful. 1 Thessalonians 1 verses 9 to 10 makes it clear that our Lord delivered us from the wrath to come. The wrath the, the, wrath the Lord will deliver us from is not hell. He's already done that. The word wrath is used repeatedly to describe the events of the Great Tribulation. God's wrath never falls on true believers. Verse 10, 19, 15, 1 to 7, 16, verse 1, and so on. It's all very scriptural. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. Wrath means the day of the Lord, in verse 2, which always refers to the tribulation. Luke 21, verse 36. Watch thee therefore and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things, that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. Revelation 3 verse 10 says, The true church will be kept from the hour of temptation about to come upon the world. The true church is removed. Before the Antichrist can be revealed, Paul said, A certain he must be taken out of the way. 
That's in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. The restrainer that must be removed is widely brought to the Holy Spirit acting through the church. The Holy Spirit would never leave the church, and without the working of the Holy Spirit on earth, no one could be saved during the tribulation. But the removal of the church, which is indwelt by the Holy Spirit, is the best explanation. The work of the Holy Spirit would go on, but his influence would possibly be less because of the missing church, you see. We, use, we are used, we are instruments to be used. The rapture is selective. Christ will not come, unfortunately, for all those who just label themselves Christians. Well, I went to church at least twice a year. Um, we loosely accept this label. We are a Christian nation. I don't think we ever have been a Christian nation, but we had Christian ideas and morality at some stage. But we were never wholly Christian. Christianity was always a minority uh, thing, I think, among the people. When I grew up, I never heard anyone talk about the Lord or Christianity. Not a single person ever. Not in church, not in, among all my friends, not at home, never ever. So it was a minority then, even then, 50, 60 years ago. The Lord comes for the bride, the true church, the remnant church, those who know him and love him. They that are Christ at his coming, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 23. And them also which sleep in Jesus, or the dead in Christ shall rise first. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 14 to 16. But the church will still be here, or what the world knows as the church. The Great Horde Church, we're told about it, it's forming up today. I could talk for a long time about how it's forming up. That's another presentation. The Great Horde Church will carry on much as before. They'll have the mass, the blasphemy of the mass, until destroyed by the Antichrist midway through the tribulation. Because although um, Antichrist uh, will work with the Horde Church, he is a jealous person. He wants to be worshipped. He's not going to have a, a, a rival spiritual entity in the world. So the whole church is hit. Rome is going to be destroyed. In the Jewish calendar, after the Feast of Trumpets, the rapture, comes Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. <coughs> this typifies the repentance of the nation of Israel after the rapture of the church. This is a time of the greatest peril for the Jewish people in Israel when Antichrist will seek to destroy them in the Great Tribulation. They will repent, one third will be saved, and then the Lord will return to save them from total destruction. We, the saints, will come with him. We don't do any fighting. Why I disagree with a mid-trib rapture. This says the rapture occurs in Revelation 11, uh, verses 11 and 12. And the two witnesses are the witnessing church for three and a half years. Why? Ascending into heaven is not a sign of their rapture, and the passage very clearly shows two people are involved, not the whole church. Again, we've got a problem that started with Augustine. The passage needs massive spiritualization to bend it to a mid-trib view. There's a big difference between tribulation and the tribulation. A lot of Christians around the world today are suffering great persecution, probably more than at any time in history. They're being put to death, they're being stoned, they're being imprisoned, they're being tortured, they're being burned alive. All around the world, in places like Nigeria, anywhere they come into conflict with Muslims, basically, they are under attack, vicious, vicious attack. They're having, they're having tribulation. The church has always been persecuted, but this is not the great tribulation. It's a different thing. John said in, in 16, verse 33, In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Every practicing Christian, whether you're in the media or teaching in school, or even a librarian, or, or any number of different jobs today, different professions, uh, how about being a midwife and being told you've got to perform, be there at abortions or you get sacked? This is going on in America. They're being pressured all the time. There are great problems for real believing Christians. There are tribulations we all go through. In this country, we just get abused and derided, but some lose their jobs. Some tribulations are worse than others, which is what our Lord meant. And the tribulation of Daniel's 70th week in chapter 9 Daniel's man of lawlessness is revealed when Jesus breaks the first seal in Revelation, which is when the covenant is made. 
And the very act reveals who Antichrist is to those who come to faith after the removal of the church. There's going to be a multitude of people converted. They're going to have a very hard time. We do not escape persecution, unfortunately. The opposite is true. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 says, Yea, and all that will give, live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. More Christians are dying today, as I said, as martyrs than at any time in history. However, the great tribulation is judgment on unbelievers, not the church. The righteous have the chance to escape, like Lot and Noah, etc. After the church has gone, God is not without witnesses. And they won't be Jehovah's Witnesses. They haven't got Jewish names. They haven't got Jewish names, have they? As we try and point out to these uh, people with silly grins on their faces giving out tracts. I say, have you got a Jewish name? No. Well then, you know, there we go. Anyway, uh, more than 144,000 of Jehovah's have died. So that sort of knocks out of court. They've got explanations for all this nonsense. They've had a lot of false prophecies too. Anyway, don't forget two witnesses and the 144,000 young Jewish men preaching the gospel of the kingdom at the start of the first 1,260 days. It has to be from the start of the second period because Antichrist, the revived Antichrist, kills the two witnesses in the midst of the tribulation, three and a half years, exactly through. So the Lord will also have an angel, of course. Who are the tribulation saints? Many will hear or remember from maybe books and DVDs that we leave lying around, the gospel truth and believe in Christ for salvation. We knew a wonderful old man in America who used to visit, Roy Krauss was his name, and he was um, about 84 and, and he was disabled and his wife had died and he was left on his own in a little, tiny little house in the middle of a small town in America. And he said, he, he was a very devout, committed Christian, and he said, Lord, what can I do? Please give me a job to do. There must be something I can do. I want to be of use to you. And he got this idea. And he got himself, the Lord gave him the idea. He got this computer and he, <laughs> he taught himself how to use it, or his grandson did, I think. And um, he got a list of the names of everybody and all the addresses of about 7,000 people in this town. And he wrote a little tract called uh, uh, if you're left behind, or don't be left behind, or something like that. It was all about being left behind. And he wrote it. It just had the Bible story, and the, the very simple sort of uh, gospel tract message in it. And uh, he decided to pray about it, and he sent it out every day to six people with an individual letter, personally written and addressed with his phone number on it. And he was going through every single person in the town with a tract and a witness and a phone number, if you're curious. He was one of the most impressive people I've ever met. And Roy, who was, he was about mid-80s, I think, when he died, he got, I think, half or two-thirds of the way through everybody in the town. He was witnessing to the day he died. He proved that you can't be, you can be used whatever your age, whatever your disability, whatever your situation. You know, even if you have no money, he had no money, he was disabled, he was very elderly, he just lost his wife. He said, oh, oh just let me die. No. It was... God's choice that he live and some work. Not to, we, can, we cannot choose the day we die. Oh, I might as well be dead. No, no, be of use, you see. So uh, a lot of things can be left behind for people. Um, who do we see under the altar? Those tribulation saints. Not the church. The church is not abandoned by God, the Holy, the Holy Spirit. She's been taken by her bridegroom, God the Son. There's a false claim that the rapture and resurrection cannot happen to, until the man of lawlessness is revealed. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. To get the, everything's always, you have to look at the context. If you take a verse out of context, Dave Regan says it's a pretext. A verse out of context is a pretext. So you look at the preceding verse. That day is shown to be the day of Christ. The Thessalonians were being told not to be deceived by anyone telling them they were now in the day of the Lord. Remember, Satan's main weapon is deception. 
He loves confusing believers about the rapture. Second Thessalonians verse 2 doesn't debate the timing of the rapture. It's a reassurance that the Thessalonians were not in the day of the Lord. Literally, it was not present. The objective statement is not directed at the rapture. The grammar and the historical background make this certain. Paul's first words in verse 3 are, let no man deceive you. That's a deception still working on the church to this day. The angel sent to gather the Lord's elect in Matthew 24, verse 31, refers to the Jews. It's nothing to do with the rapture. Old Testament prophets spoke of this regathering. Here are some words. Amos chapter 9, verses 1 to 15. Zephaniah 3, 18 to 20. And Zechariah 10, verses 8 to 12. Matthew is speaking of the final regathering spoken of by the Old Testament prophets. It makes it clear this will be fulfilled after the second coming. With the pre-trib rapture, we can expect it any year. If it were mid-trib, we would know exactly when it takes place, three and a half years in. Also, at the end of the trib, that would be seven years after the signing of the peace treaty. We know the date, more or less, exactly. Matthew 25, verse 13 says, Our Lord will return at an unknown time, well, Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 says, the Jews will wait on the Lord 1,260 days, and Antichrist stands in the temple and declares himself God. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. Armies in fine linen. When our Lord returns, Revelation 19, I like the end of the book, it gets rather delightful. Uh, verse 18, an army follows him. Riding on white horses and clothed in fine linen, white and clean. In Revelation 19, verse 8, we are told that the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. If the saints of God are returning with Christ, it will wage war on the Antichrist, then it is not possible to have a post-trib rapture without us running into ourselves as we are coming and going. It's, it's actually ridiculous. Post-trib ideas, they are no time for the beamer seat judgment, the judgments of Christ, and the marriage of the Lamb in heaven. The beamer judgment, is, of course, is when there are rewards. John 14, verses 1 to 3, a very famous passage. Our Lord's promise to return for believers. During the tribulation, a great body of believers will be saved from all nations. These are the tribulation saints, people who are converted during this awful time. The apostate, corrupt church of the time will be nothing to do with them. This whore church will back the Antichrist. The tribulation is referred to by the Jews as the time of Jacob's troubles. The church age has ended. The focus is on Israel. It's the tribulation saints, including one third of the Jews, who lived to repopulate the world after the tribulation. Many millions of souls are saved during this seven-year time frame. Those who make it through, a minority, I would think, through the tribulation go into the millennium, while the unsaved are cast into hell. And finally, the Bible has several characters whose departures are types of the rapture. Enoch was raptured before the flood. Genesis 5, verse 24. Elijah was taken up without dying. 2 Kings 2, verse 11. There he is uh, being taken up to heaven. Lot was saved from the destruction of Sodom. Uh, Genesis 18 and 19, saved from the destruction. Noah was saved from the flood in times that seemed normal. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Matthew 24, 37, 38. So we are to watch. Watch thee therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. March 13, March, uh, Mark 13, verses 35 to 37.
to summarize, the rapture is real because the Bible says it will happen, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15. It perfectly fits the Jewish Feast of Trumpets. It perfectly fits the Jewish wedding of our Lord's Day. It fits in with God removing Enoch before he judged the earth by the flood. And it perfectly fits with God removing Lot from Sodom before the fire fell. At the end, the Lord wins. At the end of the seven-year tribulation, our Lord destroys all his enemies by the brightness of his coming and the sword of his spirit. The very words of his mouth defeat his foes. That's when the third reign ends, the true reigning of millennium. We reign with him. Meanwhile, we have a great commission, which people like Sally and others here are helping get done. Our great commission is to sell the world without him. If people didn't actually volunteer to help and put things together and book halls, there wouldn't be anywhere to talk and get things like this across. So we, it's always the unsung people. It's not the speakers who do the important job, it's the people who make, this, make it possible to come and speak. So that you should always remember. Our great commission is to tell the world and facilitate the telling of the world about him. So to win the debate, arm yourselves with the facts. We've got lots on our books and DVDs. Uh, facts and refutations of error, which is important when you're talking to cultists and people who believe in different isms. They've all, they all deny the divinity of Christ. That's a, one thing that all the cults have in common. They all deny the divinity of Christ. They call him Jesus, but they mean a Jesus. It's a Jesus of their own imagination. You know, believe Jesus just like you. Oh no, you don't. You certainly don't believe he's God. Yet he accepted worship. Only God accepts worship. Those behind face a terrible fate coming to relation. We must warn them. And that's the end. You'll be delighted to learn.